Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Life Enthusiast Co-op Online Radio Network, restoring vitality to you and to the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining us is the founder of the Life Enthusiast Co-op, Martin Patella. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be alive, and uh, the world is good, if you want to see it that way. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to be delving into some sacred space today, I understand. Oh, well, yes. I would like to introduce to our audience Nick Polizzi. He is a, um, I don't know how to say it without sounding over the top, but he's a very accomplished movie producer. Uh, he's now got several titles behind his belt. These are largely documentaries in the health and getting better through self-help. Maybe we should call it self-help uh, awesome. method. And uh, I would, uh, instead of me trying to describe to you uh, all the glowing things that I would like to say about Nick, I would like him to summarize it in his in, in his own words. Welcome, Nick. Hi, guys. It's great to be here with you. Awesome. So my first experience of you was an email that Martin sent out that I got, and I about I believe it's your latest documentary, The Sacred Science, and I was really quite excited about it for a number of reasons, and, and one of which is uh, my chiropractor is a, I don't want to say collector of documentaries on health, but he has this large library that he lends out to all of his patients, and so the first thing I did after I saw uh, what what this documentary was about was I passed it on to him and the first thing he did when he uh, got my email was of course look at the page and see what it was all about and then he ordered a whole pile of them so that was pretty exciting there's a whole there's gonna be this whole group in Vancouver that knows all about the sacred science because of the work that you're doing that's exciting yeah it's very interesting when we when we first um you know, started screening the film at the film festivals. I think that we were all a little bit worried that you know, because people would, people would tell us beforehand, "Oh, this is a sold-out show, and there's going to be a lot of conventional Western medicine doctors in the in the audience, and you know, just be ready for some tough questions and some real like scrutiny after the movie's over." And it feels like you know, just it feels like health professionals from every every field kind of resonate with the film, and it's a phenomenon. Like we, we were we were waiting for some really you know, pessimistic kind of attitudes after the film was shown every time we've ever screened it. And everyone just seems like they get it like on, on a very intuitive level. And it's been, hmm. it's been a pretty amazing process to watch. That's awesome. So how did it, how did it come about? Like, how did it get started? Um, you, you know, it's kind of, this is the project that I've, I've always, you know, known we needed to make. The other films were amazing and, and, and they, they had, they were more, um, they were more based on health techniques that were becoming really popular that we were belie we believed in, um, and, and that were popular in you know the mainstream or relative mainstream consciousness. Like EFT has become you know a phenomenon. I mean, it's it's known around the world. When we made the tapping solution, it was already kind of becoming this kind of there's this groundswell of global support happening, and we're like you know what we need to kind of cover this. We need to we need to show people what this is all about. So I, I started making a lot of movies that were about more conventional holistic practices. But when I, while we were making those movies, um, talking to the experts that we, you know, we were interviewing for the films, it, it seemed like a lot of them pointed to more um, ancient traditional practices um, that were at the heart of all this stuff, and they tended to be um, shamanic practices coming from different different tribal regions of the of the the, uh, the, the globe that. You know, were being incorporated into these techniques, or were maybe at the at the origin of these techniques. Um, so once I started getting on this shamanism path, I'm like, what is this all about? Um, I started, you know, it was like it was amazing. You know, all of a sudden, you know, a, a lot of things kind of started surfacing, and people started crossing my path. You know how synchronicity, serendipity works. It's just like right. once you once you once you start start down a road that is obviously you know going to fulfill some kind of life purpose. All of a sudden, you know, things become very accessible and uh, the right gurus start crossing your path, and then you know, voila, there's the next project. Right. So I was just thinking when you're talking about the shamans and everything else, and then I was thinking of some people I know that are in more conventional uh, medicine, and they always turn to 
double blind placebo, you know, studies that lasted for six months or 10 years or something along those lines. And I was just thinking the shamanic uh, traditions are really studies that lasted for thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of years. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You I know. mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, how could, how could millions and millions of indigenous people be wrong? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. But we don't want to listen to them. And, and it's great that you're bringing this to the forefront. So tell us a little bit about what happens in the sacred science. I understand some people went into the Amazon and they spent a period of time there uh, and had quite amazing experiences. Yeah, what we did was we had we we have these wonderful communities that we built around the other two films, and when we realized that the sacred science was the next project, you know, and we had everything kind of organized down there, um, we sent out a, sent out an email to the community saying, "Hey, here is the next project. You know, uh, this is not for the faint of heart. Um, this is this is for some people who are in a serious." Um, who have serious health conditions that they have tried everything but you know hadn't had success with, um, you're going to be subjected to these these crazy you know circumstances. Um, and we got just off you know crazy amounts of applications, 500 applications, people people who wanted to come down to the jungle um, to heal. So what we did essentially in the sacred sciences took eight people from around the world who had varying health problems, um, three different types of cancer: breast cancer, neuroendocrine cancer, and prostate cancer. Um, diabetes, uh, Crohn's disease, Parkinson's disease, depression, addiction, and we brought them down into the middle of nowhere on the border of uh, Peru and Brazil in the Amazon to work with indigenous medicine men for 30 straight days. Wow. That was that. That is essentially what the you know that's essentially what the film is about, and you know, really incredible things unfold. Um, it turns into kind of a survivor like experience, but with health. And recovery as the goal, and it was really life and death for these people. Yes, it there it was definitely life and death, and I think at the heart of the movie um, is a is a the concept of life and death and how we view each and the the perspective that we in the Western world have on death versus the perspective that a lot of South American um, cultures have on death. You know, we, we tend to abhor that part of our life. We tend to not think about it. We try to stay as, stay alive as long as possible, even if we're, we have to be on a respirator and not even mentally there in this country. Um, and in other areas of the world, particularly indigenous regions of South America, Siberia, Africa, death is celebrated. You know, it's not it's not something to be scared of. It's something that is just part of part of the circle of life. And right. it's something that seems to be at the heart of Amazonian shamanism and shamanism in general, whether you're talking about Siberian shamanism, Amazonian shamanism, is this understanding of your own mortality and how it all works, how the system works and how it's a beautiful, perfect system. And there is no good and bad. There's just, there's just life, you know? You know, there's a very important point, uh, the difference between how we perceive time in the native uh, cultures. Many of them are seeing time as circular cyclical spiral returning to the same point again and again perhaps with a different understanding mm -hmm. whereas the western uh, industrial perception of time seems to be linear just one straight line running from wherever to wherever and you just get a little segment of it as your life and you want to make that segment as long as possible mm -hmm. and the, the circular interpretation sees it like well I'll be back no worries <laughs> If I don't get it this time, I'll get it next time. Yeah. It also seems like you could almost match that up, and they'll probably find some correlations between the idea of a masculine-dominated society and a feminine and a society that might be more feminine or more balanced. So I feel like the logic-based linear society is is the timeline. The time time exists on a line, and it's something that we could we have to try to figure it out. We have to try to understand and categorize, dissect and break that break everything down. Whereas I feel like in these places that we go in the world, there seems to be an embrace of the feminine or the unknown or the chaos energy that is not supposed to be uh, sorted, you know, the way that we try to sort everything. Here. We, try to, we want everything to be predictable. We don't like unknowns. The miracles right. down there seem to happen because they embrace, you know, once you embrace the unknown and accept that, then all of a sudden healing, healing you know, phenomenons happen. It's really interesting how they correlate. 
Right. You're, you're also describing the difference between late, left brain and right brain and between uh, sequential organizing and uh, random organizing of thoughts and life yeah. and all of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we have we have quite the other understanding of it theoretically here in the industrialized world, but living it seems to be a whole new experience. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Mm. Yeah. So there you are with all the leeches and uh, spiders and uh, howling monkeys and everything and these eight people, yeah? Yeah, it was pretty intense. Uh, you know, th th when we had these 400 applications, something that people people ask me a lot is, you know, how did you get through these 450 applications, 500 applications? Um, you know, it must have been so hard to kind of whittle them down. And I, it's interesting because the first thing I did when we had all these applications to go down was explain a little bit more what they were going to be in for. So everyone's like, oh, I really want to go. I think a lot of people thought that they were. This was going to be like a club med kind of trip into the jungle where. We had safely, you know, you know, built, uh, you know, some sort of an institute that was fenced off from, you know, anything scary. And once I started telling them, hey, you're going to be living in seclusion, you know, in a jungle hut that has no walls, and you're going to be living, sleeping under a mosquito net by yourself, you know, at least a half a mile away from the next person. Um, visited, you know, most of the time by by shamans who only speak Quechua and Spanish. So if you don't speak either one of those, then you're really not going to be talking to somebody, anybody very much. Once I started talking about that kind of that kind of stuff, people the, the the list started you know thinning out immediately. Then when I started talking about the, the realities of life on the ground in the middle of the Amazon, like the the poisonous spiders, the snakes, the things that are just a way of life there, you know the list thinned out even more. So by the time we had really communicated with the, with our applicants, we only had like 50 left, you know, and those people I called and just continued to talk to them and get a good feel for them. So. Yeah, it, it, it was pretty intense. The heat is intense. The mosquitoes are intense. You know, um, the, the, the moisture that's on everything on a daily basis is, is something that you have to deal with. The sound of the jungle itself. You know, you hear people write about the Amazon as, you know, the Amazon itself is, is medicine. It's, it, it sounds really fun. It sounds really like, you know, fairy tale and like, oh, that's a nice, that's a nice thought. But it's absolutely true. Like, it, it, there's such a wall of sound all the time around you. That it does something to sort of um, almost like hypnotize or, or do something to soothe soothe your thought patterns while you're there. And while when you first get there and you're kind of dealing with the hardships and you and you look at like the dampness or the you know the mosquitoes as being something that you could barely even you could barely even tolerate. By the time you're there for a week, you know you've transformed already just from being submerged in that kind of natural environment, and it becomes a lot easier. So Nick, these eight people went into the Amazon. <clears throat> they stayed in a hut somewhere and they weren't like, hi, Joe, see over there. They were like a half a mile apart from each other. Yeah, for the most part. For the, the, so um, they didn't a interact few, a lot with each other. There was very little interaction except for the weekly ceremonies. You know, there. so on top of the herbal protocol and, you know, some of the other, um, you know, healing protocols that they, that they use in the jungle that happen on a daily basis, they also do ceremonies. So what that can that can involve ayahuasca, which is a big buzz buzz topic these days. Uh, mm -hmm. Ayahuasca, um, it's it's an amazing plant, which we can get into in a little while if you'd like. Um, they, it might also involve um, you know San Pedro or coca ceremonies or you know um, just there's there's about four or five very sacred plants that are used ceremonially, usually in the, in the, in in the cover under the cover of darkness in the, in a healing temple called the maloca. And so these grow they, in the Amazon. Yeah, everything that we used in the jungle grows in the Amazon or in the Andes. Okay. So, cool. so know, San, Pe San Pedro is a cactus that grows in the Andes, so it's from a different part of Peru, but it's also used in the jungle. Cool. So the movie takes people through this process, just you're documenting and, uh, and showing what happens, yeah? Yeah, you you know, so we have we have a, a a very adventurous and brave camera crew that you know four different cameramen and a bunch of other um, a bunch of other techs that were there with us to fully capture the experience and you know beautifully in HD. Um, it was the filming process was really intense. It's it's actually really interesting. You know, EFT, which is what we use in the first what we use in the first film I made. We definitely put EFT to use a lot after we got back from the jungle because there was definitely a little bit of PTSD. You know, you you know when you when you're in a situation where 
it's a life or death for a lot of people. And then you're also surrounded by death. You're surrounded by, you know, there's so many ways to die in the jungle. You know, if you do the wrong thing, you know, there's so many ways to get yourself in trouble. So people are running through the jungle at night to try to get out to the patient's hut, you know, my, my team, you know, and getting back to the States, it's really hard to wind down from that. So it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of uh, brave film filmmakers along, along the trip with us and, we all sort of started turning to some of the trauma trauma therapies afterwards because it really was kind of traumatic. Cool. Yes, I can I can relate that you'd have to decompress just to be able to reconnect back back to your life in the industrialized world. Going from that, it, it's almost like landing on the Mars and learning a whole new culture, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, don't get me wrong; it's a beautiful it's a beautiful culture. But there's, you know, and, and you know, 80% of the time, it's it's a it's a really wonderful, um, paradise-like experience. But there's when you when you ha when you bring down people who are severely ill, um, into a place where um, there's a lot of unknowns as it is, in the hope in the hopes that, you know, the research you've done and the, the connections you've made um, are going to pay off and bring them serious healing results. Um, that whole the whole you know combination of all those factors can lead to some stress and <laughs> some anxiety. So when we got back, it was really nice to decompress and, and then know, know some other really great techniques um, to use to kind of, you know, to help release some of that stress. Cool. So without spoiling, you know, the adventures and the outcomes of the eight people that went down there, could you share maybe a couple stories of uh, some of the experiences that you or they had? Sure. Um, you know, I think that I think that one of the really interesting aspects of the film, you know, everyone wants to know, oh, who 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 got healed and who didn't. You know, it's it's really um, it's not even a spoiler to the film for me to for me to say that you know that five patients achieved extremely um, positive healing results. Uh, two of them were disappointed, somewhat disappointed, um, didn't get exactly what they wanted, and one of them never made it back. Hmm. So, so. You know, there, but the, the interesting thing is, of all the patients, you know, the one thing I know, because I've been in communication with all of them, you know, aside from the one that didn't make it back, um, is that whether or not they did, did, did or didn't achieve physical healing, the spiritual and the psychological and emotional benefits were overwhelming to all of them. And they, and they still write me about them, you know, saying, oh, my gosh, I, I can't believe. I can't believe how, you know, much processing I did in that short period of time. I mean, 30 days seems like a crazy amount of time, you know, to us on, on the outside because it's like, you know, in a situation where you're in seclusion and in, in an unknown place that seems scary. But, I mean, it really isn't that much time to be dealing with, for instance, you know, un realizing that there was, a, there was a, a childhood rape that you've been suppressing because – not because you've been tapping, not because you've been, um, you know, doing some intense work with a shaman, but just simply because you've been in isolation – you know, in nature, you know, in like a Vipassana-like situation and quieting everything down around you, taking away all your distractions. You're not even, you're not even allowed to have a notebook there. You can't even write things down. That, that's, that's against the healing protocol because it's a distraction. You can't do anything besides sit in your hut or walk around in nature around your hut and, you know, just be by yourself for 30 days. And the things that come to the surface when we stop distracting ourselves with everything that we like to distract ourselves with <laughs> in this society, um, the things that surface on their own are remarkable, and and you know there's we all have shadows, you know, and and they're and the shadows are just are a wonderful guide to healing. So I'm not sure that's a real good answer to your question, but I think one thing I did notice is that everybody had profound spiritual awakenings, and it wasn't just because of the ceremonies; it was because of the the the, the environment itself. That's that's amazing. That's and I can just see that too, just focusing on yourself, being out there in nature. Not having a TV or cell phones, <clears throat> you'd be, you'd be, a lot of stuff would be kind of coming up, and not necessarily in a traumatic way. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up in a lot of different ways. It can be, it can be subtle, and and you and you can you can you know um, what what we call it in EFT, the tier, tearless trauma, you know, techniques where you can sort of deal with serious traumas, but not have to go through a, an emotional breakdown to get there. But some of them. Um, you know, of physical abuse and, and, you know, emotional abuse that you'd never realized was there, from, you know, younger, earlier on in life, that can be pretty traumatic. And there were some, some amazing breakthroughs that are caught on film, people really going through um, some of their darkness, some of the dark, the dark corners of who they are 
and uh, mm-hmm. letting it release. And that's pretty amazing to watch. Cool. I would like to find out. Well, what do you what do you suppose a uh, person who buys this and watches it is going to get out of it? Like, what what is your goal or what is your hope for people to get out of uh, buying and watching this this movie? I think that I think that something. I think that what I would like people to get out of it is an understanding that the practices that are that are surfacing um, again. In, in our in our our modern civilization that we call holistic and alternative, they're just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, these these practices are are you know, they have origins in much much um, more complex healing traditions that are just now becoming um, popularized again or, or or at least re-examined. And that's kind of our mission is to um, both re-examine these parts of the world and these people that are just amazing people, beautiful, wonderful people. Who are still holding on to these traditions, and also understanding, bringing an understanding that these traditions are in danger of being erased forever. Um, so on one on one side, on one hand, you know, understanding that there's a lot more potential for healing um, a lot of the the, the currently incurable um, diseases that we have using these ancient techniques, and also just raising the awareness that that these people are wonderful and they tend to they tend to live in the areas of the world that are under attack by you know. By um, by natural res- the natural resource industry and you know the, these people tend to be being exploited. So the very holders of this sacred knowledge tend to be also uh, under attack, you know, from modern civilization and industrialization. So I I think that we you know there's there's, there's a sense of you know deep deep healing knowledge and benefit you know on a deep level to anybody who watches the film. But also I think that we would be remiss not to um, kind of draw a call to action to try to get more involved in helping preserve these healing traditions and um, giving back to these cultures that you know we're sort of learning from mm-hmm. great yes yeah we, All right. need, we need more awareness of what's going on and uh, how we should engage to perhaps preserve because if we wake up too late there will be nothing to discover because it will be all gone yeah a lot of these traditions are, are not written. They're not, you know, we, we sort of take that for granted. I mean, they're, most shamanic traditions are, are passed down word of mouth. They call them lineages of direct transmission. So a shaman that you meet now, an elder in the jungle or an elder in Siberia or an elder in sub-Saharan Africa, tends to um, be sort of a living vessel of, you know, and, you know of, of the knowledge that, that, that has been passed down his line. For thousands of years, word of mouth, you know, face to face, teacher to teacher, and it's like a really sacred and wonderful idea that this isn't something that anybody read in a book. Like you know, our doctors and I'm, I'm not, I, I have no qualms with modern medicine in that sense. I think that modern medicine is amazing, but a lot of it is is book reading, you know. And these um, these these medicine men, they learn word of mouth and they learn it intuitively. So and through their wanna, experiences. I'm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and on one hand, that's an amazing thing when you when you're working with a real a really um, respected and, and uh, just a really respected shaman. You're you're you can see it's palpable. You know how how powerful and just how present and you know just lo- how filled with love that person is. But the problem is once they pass away, if they haven't handed off their knowledge, that knowledge is gone forever because it's not written. So there's a serious crisis where there's a lack of shamans apprentices anymore because a lot of the youth from these tribes are being drawn into the cities to work work at menial jobs. To try to become like the rest of the world, instead of continuing to learn from the medicine men and their elders, so we really are in danger of losing losing this knowledge forever. Oh, indeed, that's quite tragic when you get seduced by watching television and using a smartphone, and for that you need to be a short order cook or a carrier yeah. of freight or something like that, instead exactly. of living in direct contact with nature. Exactly. We've kind of, we've, well, I, think we, I, think, I, think, I think we've kind of diminished the value of, of cultures that don't have the kind of um, amenities that we've achieved here in the States. And I think that there's almost a shame um, to living in such a simple, or the way we, what we would consider as simple, but which it really isn't simple. But for them, for them to be ridiculed for the way they live, I think there's a lot of pressure on the youth to kind of conform to, what's, to what we what we would look at as being, um, you know, a value, a valuable life. 
I, I totally agree. I have some friends that spend quite a bit of time in Vanuatu in uh, the South Pacific. And mm -hmm. if you compare it to other countries, you quickly discover that it's the poorest or definitely one of the poorest. And if just just based on that, you know, well, they need help and they need this and they need all these things because they don't have any TVs or, you know, where do they get their food from and blah, blah, blah. But if you actually go there, they feel sorry for us. And uh, nobody's homeless and nobody's hungry and they have a, just, it, but it's a totally non-commercial uh, in the in the sense that North America is a very commercial uh, society, and there's always yeah. lots of coconuts and there's always lots of fish, and and uh, uh, so it's just it was really an eye opener for me when I was hearing about it and talking to these friends of mine that had spent some time there, and I thought, wow, like you know, here's it, and I think that's part of the beauty of protecting places like the Amazon is it gives us a different way of looking at the world as opposed to the way that I've been brought up, for example, which, uh, you know, the idea of being able to live with no coins and pieces of paper that I exchange with people or plastic that you swipe and to be quite happy and content and enjoying life as opposed to stressed out and cursing the traffic jam that I'm stuck in. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, and it's nice to have those alternatives to sort of look at to, you know, learn from as opposed to to uh, it all disappearing. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I th there's, there's something really interesting that somebody once said, and you guys might know the quote, but I forgot what, who, the, who the guru was who said it, but they said it takes an entire village to raise a child. Mm. And that one, that's that idea to me. I mean, if you, when you go to the jungle, it's, it's right there, right in front of you. And the villages come together and the kids run around and they're all taken care of by everybody. It's just the way it is. But I feel like one of the tragedies of our of, of our our style of living is that everybody has their own private property, and it's all it's all sort of separate. We want separation as much as we possibly can get. It. And I think that just I'm I'm biased because I've been down there for so long, and I really am in love with with that culture. But I think there's some very <clears throat> measurable benefits to the idea of living um, in a society that doesn't really put much value on personal property. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, there's there's an interesting change coming forward, which is of course the introduction of this digital age of this ubiquitous communication through uh, smartphones and the likes. I'm watching my uh, kids' generation becoming more connected than we were, and they're connected with with their tribe through the electronics, which is kind of strange in the sense that it's not direct personal, but they definitely are keeping in touch with, with each other in a, in a very interesting way. It's almost like uh, an, an alternative style of being together. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe this whole thing is evolving in a different direction. Maybe they will be uh, okay eventually. I don't know. It's, it's, they it, have it a different like dream. Might... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's a value a... that... Sorry. I was going to say they're living in a different dream. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think uh, it's interesting. Right? Yeah, like you said, like with social media, like the value is no longer in like, or it still is, but not as much in the physical. It's more in the ideas. How, 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 how what, what kind of thoughts can you, can you produce here? How much, what kind of a interesting banter can you, can you deliver? You know, how, how much knowledge and how much like, you know, enlightenment can you shed on, on the community and how much, how much, you know, um, I don't know. What, how much can you give? How much can you give of yourself and, and you know, that kind of a thing as opposed to, you know, how much money can you can you spend and how, how big is your car? It seems like it's becoming less and less important, hopefully. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I see it that the accumulation of assets is becoming less important and spending time in the pursuit of worthwhile things seems to be more important these days than not. Well, you guys, you guys live in Canada, and that, and and I gotta say, like that's that. I think you guys are a little bit ahead of us, you know, down down here in the states. But you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of my friends would would uh, yell at me for saying that. But I think that um, there's definitely uh, a good vibe coming coming down down from there. So uh, here's an interesting point. Here's an interesting point of insight. Life in Canada is fairly harsh. You know, like if you screw up out there in the wild open, do you die? 
Yeah. If, if, if you go walking or driving, if you go driving out into the bush <clears throat> and forget to tell somebody and break down, we'll never hear from you again. <laughs> so in, in that sense, it's, it's less uh, threatening than, say, the uh, poisonous spiders, but the conditions themselves can be pretty harsh, too. So, sure. so I think it's the, uh, it's the lack of comfort that, uh, that brings about this awareness of how we are dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's something of that sort. And of course, the, the other thing is that even though people have guns, they're just not uh, afraid that a neighbor is going to turn on them with it. Yeah. Which I, I see it as the major difference is that uh, people are not quick to to pull the violence card. Well, whatever whatever it is, it's something that you know my my, my wife and I have talked about trying to uh, to to check out uh, you know British Columbia and see see what see what life there would be like because I love that region of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't wait for you to come up here again. <laughs> yeah, so, we'll show you around. So any last words on the sacred science, Nick, because I'd like to talk about the earlier movies that you've produced. Sure. Um, the, I guess the thing I'd like to say is just go to our site at uh, thesacredscience.com. There's a free ebook you can download there that goes into a lot of the medicines that were used in the film and uh, also a lot of the tradition behind those medicines, the history, the, the folklore. Um, I think that you'll be enchanted by it. And at the very least, it's a, it's a really great free resource to check out. Fantastic. Awesome. So you did we'll another. Put a, we'll put a link into where they can buy the movie as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So raw for thirty. Raw for thirty. How old is that thing now? It's about five years old. Wow. About six. Actually, I think it's six years old. It was such a discovery that you could actually take people out of the urban jungle. And turn them into this, essentially a farming world, right? Straight from, <laughs> straight from urban to, to nature, and have them start eating the way people ate, say up to about 200 years ago. I agree. I agree that that film that film inspired not only the people that watched it, but the people that created it. I believe, um, were we were all inspired just from what happened, you know, and and just seeing seeing how everything unfolded. It's pretty amazing. Um, I so think just, that just doing a 30-day immersion in raw food, yes? 30-day immersion in full in, in raw vegan food and, and see, seeing the kind of effects that it can have on diabetes. And the really interesting thing is I, I think that it's becoming common knowledge that um, di type 2 diabetes can be healed through diet. But an interesting fact of raw for 30 days is that one of the patients that recovered, um, his name is Kurt, ended up being a type 1 diabetic, which is obviously, we all know, is a lot harder to kick. So It's supposed it's really, to be not possible, right? Yeah, so that's a pretty, really, really interesting fact from that movie. In the movie, you know, he had, he had been recently di diagnosed with diabetes. He thought it was type 2. After, afterwards, he, his doctors did more testing and, was, and were like, no, this is actually type 1. And yet nice. he's uh, recovered, yeah? Yeah, recovered. Still, still, still doing great. You know, he's in communication with us all the time. Fantastic. So, uh, well, that, that, of course, I have been working in the uh, metabolic typing and understanding that uh, some people can be vegans very easily, and for them, the vegan lifestyle is highly appropriate. But it's mm -hmm. not a hundred. It's not a hundred percent solution. Were you? Were you aware of it then, or uh, you just tried it in a statistically significant sample, or how did you go about it? <laughs> it's funny you ask that question because I, I actually pub I actually posted an article this morning on the uh, Simply Raw blog um, about my 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 stumbling through the first six months of a raw food diet, and you know back in the back in like 2007 or 2006, and how I think in how I think it's important for people to be really careful about what they do when you, you know, just, you know, you, we tend to get really inspired when we listen to David Wolf and he's an amazing, amazing guy and a good friend of mine. But, you know, it's, it's really, I think important for people to understand that, you know, you have to make sure you're getting the nutrition that you need and everybody's built different. Um, yes. So 
for for me, I, I I was like, okay, you know what? I'm like, that's it. I'm like avocado. I'm like David. You know, I'm doing this. And we we went on the raw food diet. I went on the raw food diet for six months. And for the first two months, I couldn't believe it. I lost like 15 pounds. My hair and skin was all shiny, and it just felt like you know you're getting all the all the the things you want to get from a new a new wellness transition. Um, and then it just slowly started to I, I, it kind of hit a crescendo, and then it started kind of bringing me down. Because I wasn't really thinking much, much about, you know, okay, so what are my exact protein requirements? Okay, so what are my exact caloric um, requirements on the day? I was just getting really awed and wowed by all these veggie, veggie smoothies I was making and these salads. I was like, oh, this is amazing. Um, so I am the living example of the need for metabolic testing because it's, you know, it's something that um, I think you need to take into consideration before you make a serious health uh, diet choice because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. I mean, by the time I, I realized that my, uh, a friend handed me a photo of myself six months into the raw food diet and um, I just could not believe the picture. I was like, who is that person? I looked like a skeleton. My skin was pasty. I was, mm -hmm. I was, I had, I still had great energy, but I was starting to get, you know, aches and pains in my bones. So I had to really come correct and balance myself out. So yes, I, I did not know about metabolic typing. I did not know about, you know, uh, really understanding, you know, your own biology before you make yeah. uh, a diet choice. Right on. Well, I, I would still say that uh, raw vegan is highly appropriate for a significant number of people. Mm -hmm. But many of, uh, many of us require uh, a significant amount of protein and fat in the diet because of the adaptation of our ancestors. Yeah. So for those, for those, this is just not uh, the best strategy long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I I agree, and and you know when you, when you you and I spoke about this the other day, and um, it's been rolling around in my brain ever since because just the the, the there it seems to kind of be an interesting connection of you know the. The, the raw food movie and the sacred science movie because you're sort of going back to the roots of humanity and the roots of you know your or the origins of where we come from to yeah. uh, prop to understand what's best for you and there's a lot of intuition I think that might also help help along the way where you're kind of figuring out how you feel when you eat certain things that I think we take for granted um, is our own our own ability to figure out what's right for us you know so um, I haven't stopped thinking about metabolic typing since you first um, you first brought it up the other day. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, I, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you on this next project. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Mar Martin wants to be the star of your next documentary, Nick. Hey, if we barely the star, but I would love to participate and bring it forward. Listen, uh, if we if we move forward in any way, you know, which it, 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 it'll you know after we uh, we take care of the sacred science. Then uh, you know that you will be heavily involved. Actually, you'll you'll be the, the first phone call to figure out whether it's even a viable idea. And uh, we want to uh, film it in Tahiti, Nick. <laughs> no <laughs> way! No, no, we're doing it in British Columbia. <laughs> no. no, I vote for Tahiti. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what needs to actually happen is this metabolic typing thing shows you that you need to go visit numerous indigenous cultures. Oh, in yeah. There. Uh, in their original terrain. So, you know, the guys in Tahiti or uh, Maoris in New Zealand, they live on pork. They just, yep. they are into salty pork and barbecue pork and that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Which which is wonderful for them, but it certainly isn't what the, the Jewish guys require. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, true. If, you're going to, if you're going to live by the Old Testament, you're going to have to swear off pork and shrimp. Yeah, and I wonder. I, 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 that, that'd be really inter that'd be a really interesting study if you look at um, if you look at the the traditional Jewish diet and the restrictions. You know what happens if, to somebody who you know is a converted Jew who like now now is maybe practicing Christianity who then starts eating those things. Do they have serious reactions because that, because those rules in the Torah or you know what have you actually had some had some serious medicinal you know, value. Like, you know, this is this is what we eat. This is this is how we're supposed to eat. And if you veer, veer off of this, this is this is going to be wrong for your body chemistry. Well, here's the funny thing, uh, Dr. Peter Diadimo, that's now going back probably 15 years, put out a book uh, that de dealt with eating right for your blood type. Yep. And in inside that, he's describing the discoveries of leptin, which is the uh, which is the uh, 
proteins that you need to have in order to be able to digest certain specific protein types. And uh, the blood type B, which is the most common for the Arabic and Jewish uh, people, indeed does not have the necessary equipment to digest pork and digest shellfish. That's very Those are the foods that they are most likely to have problems with. Yeah. In a similar manner as the manner as the blood type O's have problems with wheat and and grains and uh, you know other examples of that. But. Yeah. You know, I was uh, you were telling me the other day that 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 if you're if you're um, from one of the Mediterranean countries that you tend to prefer fish or at least your at least your digestive system does over yes. um, over maybe, maybe like pork or or um, yeah. or or red meat. And I, I, I'm Italian, so I'm like, okay. So I, I've been thinking about it. I'm so I've even eat, even eating fish, you know, a little bit of fish over the last couple of days, and it just really always has felt like this I can handle, and this really helps me. Mm. But, um, but, but, but whenever I eat anything heavier than that, I, I can, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay if, if it's once in a while, but it, it doesn't. It surely doesn't give me good energy. I, I'm not, I'm not thriving on it. I can handle it because we can handle our bodies can handle a lot of poison stuff that. You know they're amazing. They're amazing machines. But when I eat fit, when I eat like a nice piece of well-sourced fish, wild fish, I feel so good afterwards. I feel like I could, you know, go out and tackle the world. You know, but sometimes, you know, if I'm eating something that's a little heavier, it just it's very subtly makes me feel, you know, Too down, heavy. lethargic. Yeah, yeah. I well, we'll get to describe it in the metabolic typing movie. But let's get back <laughs> to uh, let's get back to this raw food because raw food is fantastically important mm -hmm. for the reason that it is loaded with enzymes. Yes, and uh, for sure. the opposite of that, of course, is cooked, canned, boxed, processed, steamed, and uh, pasteurized, and all of that. Yep. And very, I think very, that was your that was your major contribution with that. With a documentary showing that if you buy food in a uh, in a downtown, uh, I don't know what they call them store, Seven Eleven or Mac or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's your grocery store, where it's okay to buy tomatoes in a can, but not okay to find them raw and fresh. The yeah, I, I think. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say I think that you know something that. Um, I believe it was Wolf, it might have been Daniel Vitalis, um, said is a properly prepared raw meal should be should have enough enzymes within it to digest itself. Correct. You're not taxing your body at all. You're you're actually eating a complete package. You know that that's going to be that that is so perfectly balanced um, that it's giving you all the nutri nutrition that you need, but it's also not taxing your body and demanding, um, you know, demanding, you know. You, enzymes from your digestive, digestive tract. Right. Whereas the common uh, state of being in, in our industrialized world is that by age about 27, you will have run out of your natural enzyme reserves and you're starting the decline, which, mm -hmm. which by the time you're 45, you're going to, well, by the time you're 35, you're starting noticing some setbacks at 45, significant setbacks at 55, you're going to be experiencing debilitating destructive changes and, and so on, right? Um, completely. You know, I was, so I was anyway, you, you demonstrated that you can reverse a lot of it by feeding people nutritionally correct food or, or raw food, right? I think, I think that, I think that, yeah, I did. And I think that something that uh, is kind of prevalent in all the movies that we've made sense and, um, just the belief system of me and my team is that, you know, before you start doing drastic things to your body to change your health, first start work looking at what you know. Get on, go on damage control first. Where where are you where are you polluting yourself? What kind of lifestyle? Whether you're talking about, you know, the food you're putting in your body, or you're talking about the habits that you have, whether or not it's the way you handle stress, it's the pent up aggression, or things like that on an emotional level or on a nutritional level. Look at look at what you're doing. Look at the habits that you have. That could be contributing to this before you start trying to go in, you know, and and do a brain do brain surgery on something that could probably be handled by a life a lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Well, we got one more uh, documentary we need to look at, and that's the emotional freedom technique one. So tell us a little bit about how this came about. 
emotional freedom technique was it so the idea for the film is I have to hand it all to my good good friend Nick Ordner who if you're familiar with emotional freedom technique then you definitely know who Nick Ordner is because he is a rising star in the world of you know of you know I guess of EFT and of self help in general um, well, he keeps coming back with novel ideas and more. He's pulling in more and more people. I just saw him on a webinar with Dr. Hyman recently, uh, yep. stepping forward into the. I mean, this this is now hitting almost mainstream, right? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's very close. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if his new book that's coming out in the next um, in the next few months is gonna. Pro it's probably gonna be a New York Times bestseller because there's just such a huge movement happening around this stuff. Um, it's emotional freedom technique, just for your listeners to, to know what we're talking about. It's called EFT. It's a it's a protocol that combines um, ancient Chinese medicine with conventional psychotherapy techniques. So you're tapping on meridian points in your face and your upper torso, and at the same time you're going through a series of affirmations, um, preferably being administered by, a, by by somebody else, practitioner. Who are really trying to get you to go into emotional um, places uh, from your past that might still be locked up and unreleased. So you're doing that in conjunction with these tapping, with the, with this tapping on meridian points and the combination. It just does. It does something. I, you know, I, I can't. I, I'm not even going to try to break down scientifically what's happening because um, I'm just not qualified to do so. And I know a lot of scientists that are still scratching their heads and trying to figure out. They, they know certain things. They, they know. They know it involves a certain part of the brain. It involves certain hormones, but for the most part, there's something about this that just works. And people try it once, and they tend to start putting it into their daily protocol, or at least their, you know, their lifestyle in some way, shape, or form. So you tap, so it, it, it unleashes it unleashes emotional trauma um, first, first and foremost. It's it's amazing at getting through um, emotional trauma. You know, PTSD. Returning returning veterans from from um, from the war are you know using this with extreme results, amazing results. Um, but a lot of times, because, because we all know, at least those of us in the alternative health world know that um, disease and emotions are connected, you know, that your emotional body and your physical body are connected. When you release these traumas, you release these negative patterns, a lot of times there is a um, correlating physical release or a physical um, symptom or, or the release of a correlating physical symptom, which could be a disease, could be an ache and pain in the body, um, and it can just go away. You know, you, you, you might be tapping. I, I used to get really bad migraines, um, and I tapped on the mic. We started tapping. Nick Ortner and I do, do some tapping. I'm, I have the luxury of having him call me, and he'll, he'll, feel, he'll feel it out. If I, if I feel a little off, he'll be like, okay, let's do some tapping immediately. I mean, the guy walks the talk. He, he, this is what he does. And we start doing tapping, and my headache turned out to be a trauma, trauma with my father. And as soon as I had that little breakdown and got rid of it, all of a sudden my migraines went away forever. So I mean, it's really, it's a really incredible technique. Yes, it is. Uh, you know, we could to delve into the whys or how it works. Uh, here at Life Enthusiast, we have been promoting the idea of water being the storage medium of memories. Mm. And so when you when you uh, clear when you, when you clear the crystallized memories wherever they may be stored they would be stored in the soft tissue of the body somewhere in the circuitry of, of the body when you when you release the blockage the flow of energy is restored and when where there is flow there is no pain when you mm -hmm. create blockages you're pooling the energies and you're, you're creating a pressure, sort of the same way as if you're, if you say choke off the uh, the blood flow from from your arm or a leg, pretty soon you're going to be experiencing pain. Well, this is subtle stuff, but it can pull in in a similar way. And so I, I, using, you know, sorry, no, it's all right. So anyway, using this technique, you're able to dislodge this energetic charge. Something that's it's sort of like recorded on a magnetic tape, except the tape isn't the tape. The tape is your energy circuits in your body, mm. and yet through this technique, you're able to release the stored memory as if you, well, let it go out, out of wherever it is, and it gets processed, released, and the, and the charge is dissipated, and uh, 
you're able to evolve past it instead of being stuck with it. You know, as you're explaining it, the book, the, the book that comes to mind that we all probably know is The Hidden Messages in Water by Emoto. Mm-hmm. Right. Because, because I mean, that there, there has to be correlation between, you know, you know correlation with, what you, with the work that you're doing. Because, you know, he's, he's one of the first guys to point out, hey, listen, there's intelligence in water. So what does that mean? When you really, when you really hand somebody that book and they like it and they enjoy it and then you start looking at the implications of what that breakthrough might be pointing to, like, you know, the fact that water itself has intelligence, geez, well, everything's made of water. So what does that mean? Does that mean that everything has intelligence? You know, so... Very interesting. Well, I, I guess you could say that no, that wa- water is the storage device, so it doesn't have any more intelligence than a, than a videotape or a DVD. Yeah. But whatever you record on it is important. I mean, do you want to listen to, uh, uh, I don't know, Beethoven or, uh, I don't know, I don't want to <laughs> wreck anybody's musical taste, <laughs> but some, some head bashing heavy metal is definitely not going to not going to create harmony in your life. It will probably yeah. serve as a vehicle to channel your uh, upset with your father <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so anyway, so there you are, are with this uh, te- technique that allows. So, do you actually teach? Do you actually teach it in the movie? Um, we don't teach. Oh, in in the tapping solution, we definitely teach it. Um, it's there's a whole there's a whole spot in the movie where you go through the protocol. Um, Carol Look, another big name in, in EFT, um, she she's also a part of the film and she just goes through the protocol. Uh, it's it's pretty awesome. It's uh, it's and then also in the film there's ten there's ten people who are coming who are you know come to this event, and they go through a four like a long weekend of retreat where they each bring something um, that they want healing on, whether it's a physical disease, an emotional disease, or an addiction. Um, and and um, Carol Look and um, Nick Ortner really kind of go at it, and they take them. They, they just do some really um, amazing work with them over the course of three days. And you know, a lot of them leave the event with substantial healing results. And then mixed into the film are a lot of experts. I mean, you'd be surprised that a lot of the a lot of the big names in self-help and um, and you know personal development use this technique. You know, Jack Canfield's in the film, Bob Proctor, Bruce Lipton. You know, just a, a ton of people that you you know that everybody knows of. You know, uses this. Thing. You know, uh, Louise Hay, obviously of Hay House. She's mm-hmm. she and Nick Ordner tap together. You know, and and same with you know I think that you know his Nick's new book is being endorsed by by Wayne Dyer. So I mean, it's. Awesome. It's a pretty big deal. I mean, every if you're in if you're into the personal development space or, or self help space, then the idea of, of this technique, you know, it's it's like a dream come true. Yeah, and the wonderful thing about this is that this this thing is actually given away. The, yeah. the technique itself. Yeah. I mean, I'm fami- I'm familiar with some other ones, like for instance, I've used healing codes, which is somewhat related or similar in some way to to this it's also capable of releasing stored emotions and stored memories but the guys chose to charge a significant amount of money for it which then made it totally inaccessible to people whereas uh, Callahan with his EFT he just released it to the public for sure yeah Gary Gary Craig and Callahan they're 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 the big they're the big heroes of this of this whole phenomenon Um, you know, talking about giving it away for free, I guess I would be I would be crazy not to not to tell your your listeners that um, right now there's a 2013 Tapping World Summit, and that is 100% free. You opt in, and then you can listen in real time to interviews with the best you know the, the best experts in the field of EFT going through different applications over the course of um, two weeks. So it really does continue to be a free resource and. It's the kind of thing where you give somebody this technique and they will use it, you know, and they can use it for free forever. It's like it's like that whole that that, that old uh, saying when you you know you, t- you can teach a man to fish that that whole saying. You know, you, yeah. people who people who want to deal with their stress, you know, um, and everybody has it. I mean, it's the most universal universal um, condition that we have as human beings that we tend to all have anxiety and stress and some baggage that we carry. So it's it's the ultimate gift to give to somebody, honestly, because they can use it right then and there. Cool. So that's The Tapping Solution at www.thetappingsolution.com. Mm-hmm. 
Awesome. So we've come pretty much to the end of our time. And Nick, I want to thank you very much. I mean, it's pretty pretty close to an hour that you spent with us, and it's just been amazing. I'm looking forward to uh, getting all the DVDs and watching them now. I only knew of the first one. I didn't know about the raw for 30 or the uh, tapping solution. Uh, is there anything you, you'd like to tell everybody before we sign off? You know, I just want to say it's an honor to be doing this work. You know, as much as, um, you know, it's it's something that we, you know, do as a business, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, we're like anybody else, you know, this is our profession. But really, the driving force behind all this is something that is much deeper. It's a deeper calling to do this stuff. And um, it's just a pleasure to be on, on calls with people like you guys and also just have the, have this, you know, I, I don't know how I was blessed to have this kind of a life where I can go around the world and try to... Um, you know, unravel some of these healing mysteries. It's just, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm great. I'm, you know, today, today's one of those days where, you know, it just feels like there's a lot of amazing things happening. I'm just grateful to be here with you guys. Thank you. We are happy to have you with us. Yes, thank you. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to be connecting with the bright, bright lights of the world. And you're one of those, you know, the, the people who actually make net contribution. Well, thank you. It's it's an honor. It's it's a, you know it's, it's all I want to do. You know, there, there, I I came into this thinking that you know you know when I was younger I was like oh I want to make I want to make documentaries when I grow up. Now it's like it's not really the, the documentaries aren't really very aren't, aren't really the focal point. It's now I need to constantly be um, helping people on the healing path and whatever that when in whatever medium that takes hold. So and I feel like you guys have the same the same mission and it's just one of those things that once it gets once it gets into your blood it's it that's it that, that's all you that's all that interests you, you there's you, no you, cure for it nick yeah <laughs> 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 oh that's too funny <laughs> okay there's no cure for bleeding heart okay <laughs> all right guys okay well, thanks that, nick with that, yeah. you know, this is this is. Thank you very much for Life Enthusiast and the people who uh, who uh, work with us. Uh, you can find us at www.life-enthusiast.com. The phone number where you can reach me is one eight six six five four three 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 eight eight. And we're uh, we're working on restoring vitality to you. Thank you.